favourite thing about Refresh is seeing women coming together, having fun together as friends and leaving transformed because they've encountered the love of God. Welcome. It's so good to see all of you. I am beyond excited about this time and what the Lord has for us. We are always honored when people choose to spend their weekends with us. And I just want to tell you from the beginning that you have been so prayed for. You are so prayed up for this time. And God has got so much for us. So thank you for being here. I can't, you know, it always seems such a long time between the one refresh to the next refresh, and then all of a sudden it's here. So it's just awesome. And especially for those that are here for the first time, I hope it won't be your last. I think it's going to be a wonderful experience for you. I wanted to read a scripture in Judges 15, 19, and I, I was praying for this time, and he, the Lord showed me the scripture, and it says, Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. And it's such a powerful scripture because there's an invitation for us to drink. There's an invitation for us to come and to drink deep of his love and to be strengthened and to be revived. The fascinating thing about the scripture is that the Lord provided the water, but Samson had to drink it. And we get to drink. He has provided everything we need to quench any thirst that we have. Our theme for this year, as you know, is, is flourish, and I love definitions, and one of the definitions is to grow luxuriantly and to thrive. And that is what is on the Father's heart for us. He wants us to thrive, and this is what we're expecting this year. You and I were designed by God to thrive, not just survive. We haven't been put on this earth and given a number of years to just be hanging on by a thread. He has designed us to thrive. Psalm 92, 12 says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. The Amplified says, majestic, stable, durable. It's still my favorite translation. My husband calls it the multiple choice translation, <laughs> but it kind of just says it, says it all. But the promise is that the righteous shall flourish, and in Christ, that's us. Genesis 49 is another great scripture. It says, Joseph was a fruitful vine near a spring, and it says his branches climbed right over the wall. And if you see some of these beautiful flowers, especially as the spring comes, and, they, and especially those creepers that go right over the wall, that's what our lives are designed to look like, like branches that go right over the wall with much fruit that everybody can eat from the fruit of our lives. As I was thinking about tonight, I just felt like there was all these little buds all, on all of our lives, these little buds that are going to burst open this weekend, dreams that are going to be just ignited again and hope restored, and gifts of faith for things that we've been trusting God. All these little buds are going to come into bloom so be trusting the Lord with me for that and drink deep of what he has for you. Let me pray for us. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for each and every beautiful daughter that has come through the doors tonight. Thank you, Lord, that you have designed us to thrive and bear much fruit, Lord. And Father, I thank you for the many little buds that are going to just burst open with life this weekend. Thank you, God for your goodness and your mercy that does follow us all the days of our lives. Amen. Amen. I want to start my message by telling you some of our story, and there are many of you in this room that probably know it, so if you will just, you can be, you can be praying for me while I tell you our story, okay? But before we move from Atlanta to South Africa, from South Africa to Atlanta, there we go. Where are you going? <laughs> um, geographical hitch there. But it started with a dream. And one day my husband woke up and he said, I've had a dream. And I saw the continents of the world shift. And that's called a continental shift. At the same time, I had been just reading scriptures about nations and it 
it was that time when the hill song, a golden oldie came out, it's from Psalm 2, and it says, ask and I will give the nations to you. And every time I heard that song, something just rang in my heart, but I didn't know what it was. It was just, you know, sometimes you hear a song and your eyes fill with tears and you don't quite know what it is, but something's it's kind of deep to deep. But he had this dream, and so we said, well, that's interesting, and we kind of thought, does it mean we're having a continental shift, or are we going to just go to other countries? But it was clear over the course of time that God was calling us to make a continental shift. And so we got a map, and we put it on our dining room table, and we thought, well, if we're shifting continents, it's not Africa. But we really didn't have an idea at that moment what it was. But over a three-year process and receiving counsel from others and waiting on the Lord, it came clear to us that we were going to be making a continental shift to the United States. Now, if you've ever done that, and some of you here have, you know that that means multiple conversations with friends and family, lots going through a lot of Kleenex. We were leaving a ministry that was successful and wonderful, people we loved. We had to make a decision to leave financial security that we had built up and everything that was comfortable and familiar. And yet the Lord was stirring this in us. And, and we found ourselves in this place where we had to weigh the cost of, yes, Lord, we will make a continental shift which honestly at the time made no sense. We weren't running away from anything. Sweet meaning people who love Jesus told us, I think you're making a mistake. You may, maybe you want to think about that again. We got a lot of counsel not to go, but we knew this is what God was calling us to. And we said yes, and we trusted him, and we knew that if this is what he was asking of us, it was for our good. One thing we never doubted through the whole time was the faithfulness of the Lord. I've got some pictures up here, and these are just some of the things that were on the other side of our saying yes to the Lord. And you can, you can leave that up for me for a little while, but I, you know, I look around us now, and I see nations. There's Uganda, we had a trip and in, a couple of years ago, we were in Chiang Mai at the a Global Forum for World Without Orphans just different, different things that have happened. I, I, it's about my son-in-law, Tyler, and my daughter with her little one, Evangeline. We didn't know that that was waiting on the, on the other side when we said, yes, God, we'll make a continental shift. I see beautiful friendships in front of me tonight, and all of you here, I didn't see that when we said yes to the Lord. This, this yes led us to a deeper understanding of His amazing grace, we didn't have that understanding when we said, yes, Lord, we'll, we'll make this shift. But all this was on the other side of us saying, okay, God, we'll go. And we didn't see it. When we boarded a plane, it was November 16th, 1999, we said goodbye, and we came to the USA. And I remember the very first night in a, we were in an apartment, first night in our home, and we were like, what have we done? Where's all the people? You know, it's like kind of weird. It's just like, well, it's you and I, honey, you know, we're going to make this happen because God said so. Why do I tell you this story? We, we, can, we can take it off. But I tell you the story because the dreams that God has for us and the things that he has on his heart include us being fruitful, include us seeing success. In John 15, it speaks about us bearing much fruit, that God has created us and designed us to bear much fruit because when our lives are fruitful, He is glorified. It's a testimony to His goodness. The same way, if you're a parent, you long to see your children thrive, whether it's the children in your family or spiritual children. I want to see my children thrive. I want to see them do well. And even more so does He want to see you do well. Now, you might think, well, that's really awesome for you, but you have no idea what my life looks like. And that's probably true. But it doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy. I'm not saying that. We know that. There are some really tough seasons that we have to walk through in life. And I've realized that most things of value come with a cost. They do. But saying yes to the Lord and inviting His lead and saying, God, would you, would you lead me also comes with great joy and eternal reward. So the title of my message 
is on the other side of yes. On the other side of yes. What I want to do is I want to walk us through some stories in the scripture, and I want to have a look at some courageous yeses. I want to have a look at what was experienced on the other side, but I also want us to have a look at some of the hurdles and some of the battles, because they're there. I want us to have a look at some of the emotions that the people went through when a command came or there was a nudge from the Lord to move into a different space. And I'm pretty sure that we'll all relate to at least one. As I, as I was preparing this, I was like, oh, I can understand what they felt like. And I think you will too. So our first story is called Lower Your Nets. And in Luke 5, we find Jesus on the boat with Simon Peter. These guys were not happy. They had been fishing all night, and they'd come to the shore to clean their boats. They probably smelt like fish, or fishing boats. They were disappointed. They were, they were sad. They were discouraged. They had caught nothing. I'm going to read to us in Luke 5, verse 4. It says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a haul. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night exhaustingly and we've caught nothing. I don't think there's a woman in this room that doesn't know what it's like to feel exhausted. You don't have to raise your hands, but I think you know what it means. Maybe that's what you're feeling right now. This is a key scripture here. It says, but on the grounds of your word, I will lower the nets again. And when he had done this, he caught a great number of fish. And they signaled to their partners. They called in other boats. There was so much fish that the nets were literally, boats were sinking and the nets were breaking. Jesus tells them to lower their nets for a catch. He knew what was coming. He wasn't saying, just, just go and try one more time. Let's see what happens. He knew that they would catch so many fish that they would need reinforcements. But at this moment, this command from the king of kings, from their friend, from the one they trusted, was not an easy one. It was a tough command. These men were tired. They were hungry. They were, had probably had families waiting for all the fish that they were going to cook out for dinner. But, and these men knew there was nothing out there. These were seasoned fishermen. This is what they did. But they went out again, not because of how they felt, but they went out again on the ground of his word. Because he said, I want you to go out again to catch fish. And that's when they caught the multitude of fish. That's when their boat started to sink. That's when the community saw a miracle in front of their eyes. And their obedience to the Lord didn't just feed them. It fed multitudes because they said, God, we will cast our nets one more time. When I read the story, I, I wondered about whether they argued amongst themselves. I wondered whether I would be the fisherman that said, you know what? I'll see you tomorrow. I'm going home. <laughs> Been there, done that, put the net, both sides, nothing. And I think their biggest hurdle to this command must have just been sheer exhaustion. It wasn't a big sin issue. They were just really tired, and they were discouraged. Maybe you're here tonight, and maybe you've been praying for someone in your family, maybe a spouse, maybe a child, and as you sit here tonight, you haven't seen what you've hoped for. I know what that feels like. I think many of you do. You're discouraged maybe by the current circumstances. Maybe you're trusting God for a business breakthrough or financial provision or a physical need that's been hard. Some of you may know what it's like for the Lord to say, would you lower the net one more time? Will you go out beyond your exhaustion, beyond your disappointment, because you know that he's good? Because you know that it is in his heart to cause you to bear fruit, to cause you to flourish. Their obedience didn't just affect their life. Their obedience led to an overflow for many. There are times when our yes will need to go beyond our exhaustion, beyond our disappointment, because we know who he is. We know who he is. 
The second one I want to look at is the man with the withered hand in Luke 6. Luke 6 to 10, we can put the scripture up there. Everything about this scenario is uncomfortable, it's vulnerable. Jesus tells this man in Luke 6, he says, come and stand in the middle of the people. There's all these people around, and he says, will you stretch out your hand? This man's been walking around with, with, a, with a deformed hand, and maybe m- most people haven't seen it, they just thought his sleeves were too long. But Jesus says, expose your weakness. Expose what doesn't necessarily look good, because I want to restore you. Will you expose it so that I can heal you, so that I can restore what's broken, so that I can take the pain away from you because I love you? Every single thing he does, every command he gives us is always motivated by his love for us. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will nudge us. Many of you know what that feels like. I do. He will nudge us to ask for help. But I don't know about you, maybe it's an introvert thing, I don't know, but sometimes it's less painful to actually ask. Sometimes it feels less painful to just walk around like this and let let nobody see, and not to ask. Because I don't want to tell you that I'm struggling. Every time the Lord encourages us to receive help, or to come to Him and say, Father, this is my struggle, and we all have struggles, it's only and always because he loves us. It's always motivated by love. It's never to bring shame or embarrassment. It's always because he so longs for us to thrive. He wants to see us restored. He wants to see us healed because I know that he wants to take off everything that hinders us from the things that he's purposed us for. I am very thankful for friends, for a community of believers around me where I can go and say, will you please pray for me? There's a freedom and a protection in having places where we can go and expose our pain and say, this is, I'm really struggling with it. Will you please pray for me? Many times, hiding behind our insecurity is just a lie that we've believed, just something that we've become familiar with. It's like this friend that hangs around, not really a friend, but it's a familiar lie. But when these lies get exposed, they don't have any hold on us anymore. Because many times the power of of a stronghold or power of sin is in the secrecy of it. But when these things get exposed, it, it breaks the power. I used to believe that nobody liked me. I, I really believed that. I struggled under rejection for many, many years. But the, the lie manifested in a very withered version of who I really am, who God created me to be. This lie manifested in a withered version of me. But when it was exposed and I realized what it was and I realized the truth that I am loved and I'm cherished and I'm chosen by Him, it became easy to love other people. I could could give the hugs and I could receive love and I could enjoy deep friendships. Because the, this root of rejection was exposed and was healed. I remember years ago, somebody told me, you're very aloof. And I, I went home and had a good cry about it. And I was like, I'm not aloof, I love people. <laughs> but, 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 but I acted aloof because I didn't really respond physically to hugs and stuff. It wasn't my thing. But it's become my thing because there's a wholeness that's come. And I'm so thankful for that. That I, that I, could, I, didn't have to, I don't have to keep hiding this lie but I can expose it and say I'm free. And as this man did, I want to ask you, can you trust the Lord to get past embarrassment, to get past what's hurt, and say, yes, God, I'm going to respond to your call of healing, because he's always calling us to healing. And I want to say, let's trust him enough and ask him, even ask him the question over this weekend, Lord, what is behind this fear? What is behind this insecurity? because it's not ours to carry. My hope is that, that just this, this space of this weekend here is a safe place for you. There will be opportunities throughout the weekend to receive prayer. We love praying for one another at Northlands. 
And we're going to have many opportunities for that. And that's not to say you have to, you have to go to someone for prayer and you have to just pull it all out there. You don't have to do that. But there will be opportunities to just say, well, I'm struggling with something, won't you stand with me? You don't even have to tell us what it is. But we want to partner with you. We want to see you come free more than anything. There's going to be times when our yes will overcome embarrassment and it will overcome insecurity. But oh, the beauty, what's on the other side of that time. The next story is the woman with the issue of blood in Luke 8. And we can, we can put that scripture up there. I, I won't read it. But in Luke 8, we find the story of a woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. I can't, I can't even imagine what she must have felt like and even looked like, just weak and tired. And no one had been able to help her. But this woman finds out that the healer has come to town. Can you imagine just the, the excitement in her? There's, maybe there's a last hope for me. And she knows if she, if she can just touch the hem of his garment, she will be healed. So what would be her biggest hurdle? He's coming to town, she can go touch the hem of his garment, and she's going to be healed. But there was a hurdle that she had to overcome. The scripture there says that she was trembling. So this was, this was a pretty big deal for her. I think her hurdle must have been fear. The very real fear of being caught. I would imagine that in, a, in the village at that time, that because it had been such a long time, she pro people probably knew that she was the woman who had been sick for so long. And she was not allowed out because she was considered unclean. And so if she touched anybody on her way or came into contact with anybody or anybody saw her, they would, they would be made unclean and would have to go to the temple and get cleansed. It was an issue. She was not allowed out. And so there was a tremendous bravery that had to be exercised by her. She had to push past fear. She had to push past what is culturally accepted. She had to push past the crowds. I don't think they had sunglasses at that time, but she had to cover her head. She couldn't be recognized because she was unclean. But her last resort in her mind had come to town and she wanted healing. Sometimes a yes to God is going to mean pushing past what is socially acceptable, what is culturally normal. It's gonna require risk, it's gonna require bravery, it's going to have to go past that feeling of fear and heart racing and adrenaline. This woman was trembling. But on the other side of her faith-inspired yes was her miracle that changed her life forever. Was it worth it? Absolutely. Are there places maybe in your own life that you've been wanting to push past? But maybe it's kind of, you, you wrestle with, this doesn't really look what, like what everybody's doing or what will people think. But what might be waiting on the other side of a bold step? What could maybe be waiting for us there? What's on the other side of pushing past what everyone else is doing, what is well thought of in society? What is worth taking a risk because God is stirring something in us? Maybe your faith in his, in his power has been stirring you to say, yes, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to press past resistance. I'm going to touch the hem of your garment. Because a yes to God sometimes will mean pushing past fear, pushing past what we're feeling. The next story I want to look at is Noah, Noah building the ark. In Genesis 6, we have this famous story of Noah and the ark. And I'm pretty sure that Noah's yes to God came with much ridicule. Here's this crazy old man, and he's going to build an ark, and there's no rain. And it was a big ark. The key verse for me is found in, in Genesis 6, 9. It says, this is the history of the generations of Noah. Noah was a just and righteous man, blameless in his generation, Noah walked in habitual fellowship with God. That is such a key verse. If you're highlighting, highlight that one. If I'm walking in fellowship with somebody, it implies that we have a friendship, 
that we have regular communication, that we know what's going on in each other's lives. That was Noah's relationship with God. Noah was God's friend, and he recognized his voice. And so he trusted the command of his friend to go and build a boat when it didn't make sense. We know the story. After 40 days, the rain stops, and, and the ark lands on a place called Mount Ararat. And Ararat means the curse is reversed. Noah's obedience saved the world and represented what was coming with Jesus on the cross. The curse was reversed, and now we live under his grace. That's how key the story of Noah and the ark is. Noah's hurdle, I think, might have initially been, Lord, is this really you, God? Maybe the sound's not clear. Are you building, building a boat? Noah had to overcome what the community might be thinking. You know, none of us want to be told, you know, bless your heart. <laughs> I know now. I now know what that means. <laughs> you know, I had to learn that, but you know, bless Noah's heart. He's going to go build a boat. That's sweet. We'll 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 watch him. But on the other side of the of this crazy yes, a yes that took over a hundred years to find context. There was no context for what Noah was doing. The boat only came into context when the rain came. But the world was saved and mankind could continue because Noah's family was kept safe in the ark. I guess my question to you is, what might you be wrestling with to do? Maybe there's things that God's nudging you to do. Projects to initiate, books or blogs to write, a business to start. I'm not sure it's going to work out. Wow, well, I don't know if I can do that. It's going to take a really long time, Lord. Have you seen my schedule? I don't know if I can do this. But what might be on the other side? That's always the, que that's, that's the question I'm starting to ask myself. What is on the other side of that? Yes, I'll build the boat. What is the Lord maybe nudging you to do? And you know that much of what he asks us to do is not just for us. It's going to affect generations to come. What's coming up behind us because we've said yes? I believe God is looking for those that will walk in close friendship with him and sometimes do the radical things that don't make sense, that might not have a context right now. There are thousands of ministries and businesses that made no sense when they started. Compassion started in the heart of one man, and he was moved by Korean war orphans in 1952. It was Reverend Swanson. And he encountered the bitter poverty of Korean children that were unwanted. And that started Compassion International. And look at where it is now. Millions of children being looked after. What about World Vision? In 1947, there was a Reverend Pierce, and he was introduced to a little girl called White Jade. Love that name. She was battered, she was abandoned, and he said, I can give you $5 to help with her. And he said, I'm gonna send you $5 every month. $5 had a lot more value at that time. But he said, I'm going to give you $5 every month. And that's how World Vision started. Now they are, and I might not have these facts exact, but about 40,000 staff members in 100 countries. There's emergency relief programs. There's community development because one man said, I see a need here, and I'm going to start something. Our yes perseveres past what others might say or even think. And it doesn't always make sense at the time. The fifth one is Jesus, yes, to the cross. It's kind of a standalone, isn't it? This is the last one, and for me, the most radical and costly yes that was ever given was his yes to the cross. And you know, Jesus was so, we read the story, but I, I've realized that reading it again in preparation, just how very conscious he was of what was coming. And he said, Father, if you are willing, Will you remove this cup from me? Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
in the Passion, it says, will you take this cup of agony? It was a cup of agony. He sweated blood over this. But on the other side of the most painful and humiliating and costly, yes, I would say to date, was eternal life for you and for me. I am so thankful, so thankful that he said yes, even though he weighed a very high cost. Now, Jesus never said it would, that life would always be easy. He didn't say it's all, we're going to be tiptoeing through the tulips all the days of our lives. I think we know that. But he did promise us a fruitful and victorious one. And there will be beautiful seasons that are wonderful and easy and full of laughter and fun. And there will be seasons that are hard, where there's tears and we're hanging on to who we know him to be. There will be those seasons when I'm up against the rock face and it's you and me, God. But he still says, I've called you to fruitfulness and I've called you to victory and I've called you to joy and peace and provision. Because the reality is, ladies, it's far more important what's going on on the inside of me than what's going on on the outside of me. Because Jesus inside of me doesn't change. He is victorious. Circumstances will be high and they'll be low, they'll change, they'll fluid. But he remains the same, which means I can always know his joy. I can always know his peace. He did say that I'm going to seat you at my right hand and I'm going to give you everything you need to say a bold and courageous yes. To cast your net one more time. To bring the weak places into his presence. To trust him for the withered places to be made whole. To trust him for healing because it's part of my inheritance to trust him for the things that I might not yet see, but because he says so. He has called us to be those who expect the impossible to become possible. Many times the Holy Spirit is going to stir something in us that we long for or desire, something radical. There's that, that God-given ache so deep that it's hard to bring words to. Maybe there's healing for a broken relationship or something that you just long to see restored. Maybe there's people that you just long to see saved and come through something. And maybe even tonight, God's giving you some ideas. I believe through this weekend, God's going to start to ignite and, and press on some dreams again. Maybe you're wrestling with feelings of, of, of fear and possible ridicule. That's real. We want to make these bold declarations, but sometimes we wonder, I mean, am I taking it too far? I want to say, make the bold declarations. Put your declarations up on, on your mirror, in your Bible, wherever you can, in your journal. Make the bold declarations, because He is good, and we trust Him. It's not going too far. Reveal what is with it. Push, push past what might be socially acceptable. Push past that because there's a miracle and there's breakthroughs that he has lined up for you. I want to say, let's dare to step out and say, yes, God, I'm going to trust you because there's fruitfulness on the other side. Ladies, there are nets to be filled. There are marriages to be healed. There are lives to be transformed. There are businesses to succeed. There are finances that God wants to multiply in our lives, not just for our sake but for the sake of the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 3 says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. I just want to prophesy and declare over you, you are very bold. Yeah. Wendy Backlin says, don't, say, don't wake up and say, how am I feeling this morning? Wake up and say, what do I believe? Yeah. So I want to say to you, what do you believe? And I want to say, believe that you are bold. Yeah. You and I were created to be, be bold. We were created to say some bold yeses because the spirit of the living God is bold and he lives in us. And he wants to come, us, come bring us into agreement. Sometimes we're out of agreement. He wants to bring us into agreement with who he says we are. He wants to see us flourish and bear fruit. Every invitation to a yes is rooted in his love. And it is always intended for our blessing, never our harm. There is no invitation from the Lord that is meant to harm you. It is always for your good. 
Maybe, maybe there's a yes that he's asking of you that will need to go beyond some disappointment. And I'm sure there's disappointments here. Maybe it's going to need to go beyond embarrassment. It's going to push past some fear. And it's going to mean persevering beyond what others may think. But I want, I want to say to you, go say your bold, faithful yes. Go say that courageous yes and see what he will do on the other side of it. Because there is another side. There's another side. There was fish waiting to jump in the boat. What I would like to do for us now, we're coming to a close, is I want to pray for us. And if you feel like something stirred in your heart, or there's just a struggle and you're saying, God, it's time for me to get beyond that. I'm going to say yes to healing. I'm going to say yes to restoration. There are situations here that need to be restored. And you know what? He's the best one to do it. He really is. If there's something that's stirring in you and you're saying, God, I want to do this, something that's not just going to affect your life, but generations to come, there's women that are going to, whose lives are going to be transformed and healed because you're saying, I'm going to take on this initiative. I want to say, say that bold yes. If any of this just touches you in your heart and I'm standing with you, I'm going to ask you to stand and I want to pray over us. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, that all, all over this space, Lord, we are standing, Father, because we love you. And we know, Father, that when you ask us to say yes, Lord, it comes because you want us to be fruitful and thrive and experiencing your joy, Lord. It's not to harm us. Thank you, Lord, for an invitation to lower our nets one more time. An invitation, Lord, to to bring that which might be weak into your presence and say, thank you, God, for your healing, Lord. Father, I thank you that every invitation, Lord, is never to burn us out, Lord, but always because you love us and you have so much waiting on the other side that we don't see tonight. Father, I just release boldness and courage over your daughters, Lord, tonight. Father, I break a spirit of timidity. I break a spirit of fear. I break a spirit of rejection that's held us back from saying, yes, I'm going to step into what you have. Father, I break it for anything that has hindered us from saying a faithful yes, from pushing through stuff to touch the hem of your garment. Lord, we say yes, Lord. We, we declare we are bold and we are courageous because of who you are and because of what you did. Father, we thank you for the most courageous, most beautiful yes to the cross. Lord, you have made us bold, Father. You've given us all we need to say yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.